Hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Elisa Ewan, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. Today, I'm excited to present our Alumni Career Development Webinar featuring alumna Nancy Goldman. This series, co-sponsored by TC Next and Alumni Relations, covers a range of career-related topics and features speakers from a variety of industries. Videos of past webinars are available on our website at www.tc.edu slash alumni slash career webinars. We are so thankful to our alumni hosts who have shared their time and expertise to help us create meaningful and engaging programming for the TC community. Today, Nancy presents, Tell Me About Yourself, Storytelling on Job Interviews. Nancy Goldman has her doctorate in adult learning and leadership from Teachers College Columbia University, where she also received her master's degree in organizational psychology. She's an adjunct assistant professor at TC and at NYU, where she teaches storytelling and employee engagement. She has led storytelling workshops at many organizations, including MIT Sloan School of Management, Barnard's Athena Leadership Lab, the Producers Guild, the Actors Fund, and Gays Men's Health Crisis. Nancy has provided a handout which was included in your reminder email. You can also take the time now to download the link provided in the chat. We will be having a few discussion questions which will be utilizing the chat feature. If you have any audio or technical issues, please chat me directly. And without further ado, Here's Nancy. Thanks, Alyssa. It was a Saturday morning and I was sitting in Zenkel Hall, sipping my coffee black and staring at the clock on the wall. The professor was a woman in her 40s wearing three shades of beige and she began talking. And like Charlie Brown listening to his teacher, I heard wah, wah, wah. Until she said, we learn through stories. We learn about organizations through the stories that are told about them in the media. We learn what goes on inside organizations through the stories that we gossip. And we learn how to conduct ourselves in organizations by stories that are told about its shared norms. My eyes opened like saucers. I mean, I knew instantly that this was something I was interested in. But I also knew that I had to get through my dissertation and I couldn't let any like shiny new objects like this one take me off course. My dissertation was about how comedians learn to use humor to raise consciousness and awareness about social and political issues. And interestingly, one of the findings from my research was that comedians draw on their personal experiences. In other words, they tell personal stories. Well, there was that shiny new object again. So shortly after I defended, I took a class in personal storytelling, and then I started giving workshops helping people communicate through storytelling. I was invited to teach a course about the use of narrative in organizations at NYU, and that's when I really began to understand the many ways that stories are applied in a business environment. And job interviews are one such way. Comedians tell stories to entertain and to make us laugh. And today we're going to look at another reason to tell stories, to persuade and to influence. So this is our agenda for our time together. Um, first, we're gonna discuss why telling stories is an effective and compelling way to communicate on a job interview. And there are scientific reasons that back up this claim. So we'll look at a couple of those. Then we'll review the types of questions that are asked on an interview and that may elicit a storied response. We'll examine six criteria for an effective story. And I'll provide a simple formula for how you can construct your own story. And lastly, we'll discuss the importance of having a dedicated listener as you're developing your stories. And around the middle of that, we'll evaluate a sample story, which is the handout that you got before the webinar. And we'll look to see if and how it meets the criteria for an effective story. So 
So hopefully you'll take away the following from our time together. One of the goals is that you're able to recognize opportunities to tell a story. Uh, some questions in the way that they're posed are invitations to tell stories and listening for those opportunities is really the first step towards telling stories. Um, you'll be able to understand some of the findings in neuroscience that show why storytelling is compelling and a critical communication skill. Um, scientists have made a lot of progress in understanding the impact of storytelling on our brains since MRI technology and functional MRI technology has become more sophisticated in recent years. I find that stuff really interesting. The six criteria for an effective story are the elements that interviewers are listening for when you're telling a story. So you tell a story, this is how they're evaluating you. You don't want to tell stories that are, are rambling and rudderless because you will lose the attention of your listener. And these criteria will keep you on track. You'll learn steps you can take to prepare your own stories. And I want to emphasize preparation is really paramount to feeling confident in your presentation. And lastly, you'll understand how to construct a story using three simple steps. It's an easy uh, structure that can be applied in this context. So here I'm, I'm talking about why being a compelling interviewee is important. And I don't want to hammer us over the head, but we all know that you know, the unemployment rate is high and there are a lot of people who are unemployed. Um, it's been a crazy year. It's going to probably continue to be a crazy year. And according to the New York Times, if the rate of the September job creation were to be sustained indefinitely, it would actually take another 17 months for the economy to be back to its pre-pandemic levels of employment. So we're hoping many jobs will come back when the pandemic is over or when a vaccine is developed. But in the meantime, it's essentially a buyer's market, you know, buyer's market in air quotes. And job seekers need to do all the things they would normally do and more. I mean, you have to leverage your network, reach out to your contacts, build new skills, retool old skills, be open to new opportunities, and keep your eyes out for ways to get an advantage over your competitors. And to me, that's where storytelling comes in. It's, it's a tool to have in your uh, multivaried toolkit. And I do think that storytelling has some unique advantages. Someone who is a good storyteller is thought to be articulate. Telling a good story shows that they can organize information in a coherent way. They can demonstrate temporal logic, things that occur um, over time. Or they can uh, illustrate cause and effect. B happened because A happened. And a good storyteller can make us feel, which has two important benefits. We tend to remember things more when there's an emotional charge to them. And many believe that it's actually our feelings that inform our decision making and that our feelings are followed by our thoughts, which support that decision. So not the other way around. And just as a fun uh, note, there's even a theory that our ancestors who had rhetorical skills may have appeared more attractive to the opposite sex. So there are actually evolutionary reasons why storytelling has existed since the beginning of recorded history. So interviewing remains one of the most significant and preferred tools in making hiring decisions. And I think of preparing for an interview as an outside job and an inside job. Preparing for an interview is an outside job and an inside job. The first task for an applicant is to carefully review the job posting and especially in particular the job description. If you know someone who works in the field or even better the company, then call them to get ideas to better understand the role and the ch challenges that are faced in the role. So you're going to evaluate the position with regard to the critical skills it requires. And if it, if it helps, you can you know, just take a piece of paper and draw a line down the center of the page and list those critical skills of the job on the left. After analyzing the needs of the potential job, then you have to do your own reflection on your own experiences 
to see what in your past experiences match the needs of the job. Here you'll review your academic, volunteer, work history. If you're new to the workplace, you can include academic projects and assignments, study abroad, volunteer work, internships. If you've been in the workplace for a while, you'll rely more heavily on your work experience, volunteerism, community involvement. And you can write these relevant experiences on the right side of the line that you drew down the center of the page. And this preparation lays the foundation to determine and craft stories that are appropriate for the job interview. So on this slide, you'll see listed two types of questions that interviewers commonly ask. Behavioral questions ask applicants to recount experiences from their personal and professional lives that demonstrate their skills and abilities. So this way employers can learn what applicants will do based on their past performance, what they've accomplished or even what they've failed to accomplish, how they went about doing it, and hopefully in situations similar to the ones that they will face on the job. And the reason that these types of questions are frequently posed is that research suge suggests that past behavior is a good predictor of future behavior. And so an example of a behavioral question might be, can you provide an example of a specific instance where you developed a sales presentation that was highly effective. So that, just pay attention to the, the prompt. Can you provide an example? That's a prompt for um, an opportunity to tell a narrative, a story. And then of course, there's an additional question on the screen. What was the most difficult conflict you faced at work and how was it resolved? Situational questions ask you to imagine a situation that you may be in in the future and describe how you would act in that hypothetical job related situation. So an example might be, suppose you were giving a sales presentation and a difficult technical question arose that you couldn't answer, what would you do? And the theory here is that intentions predict behaviors. And there's another a question, an example of a situational question on the screen. Imagine you receive a phone call from a customer who is angry about their bill, what would you do? And both types of questions invite you to respond with a narrative. There's also a prompt that is not quite a question, but which invites a narrative response. It's a common fallback for a busy manager who wants to catch and tr you know, try and catch you off guard or learn a lot about you in a short amount of time. And so that is the old favorite, tell me about yourself. And I'll go into how you can respond to that question a little later, but that definitely invites a storied response. And just so we're on the same page, there are a lot of definitions about story out there. A lot of them are very technical. Um, here's one that's definitely more simple. A storyteller presents actions that take place in a certain setting the actions are linked with individuals involved in the narrative, and they are presented in an order that emphasizes a particular point or action. So I'm gonna give you more details about how to tell a, a story, but first I really wanna persuade you of why you should respond with a story. Storytelling is simple. I mean, it's something that mankind has been doing since time immemorial. And so we really instinctively all know how to do it. Um, and it's a skill that can be improved upon. So even if you're sitting there thinking now, uh, I'm not so good at this, you know, rest assured that with some tools and some practice, you can definitely improve. Stories are easier to remember than facts. So stories that are personally and emotionally compelling actually engage more of the brain. And as a result, they are better remembered than simply stating a set of facts. So for example, if you're watching a PowerPoint, 
there are two parts of your brain that light up, the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. And those are the language processing parts of the brain. It's where we decode words into meaning. But storytelling has the capacity to light up other parts of our brains as well. So for example, if I said um, a velvety rope or a leathery, gro leathery gloves, those terms, because they're, um, they're sensory, they can light up our sensory cortex in addition to the other parts of our brains. So more of our brain is involved when processing a story which makes them easier to remember. Mirror neurons create coherence between brains. I'd like to tell you about this. So when I tell you a story, a part of my brain lights up. And when you hear that story, the same part of your brain lights up. And scientists like Uri Hassan call this neural coupling. That's due to the mirror neurons. And so this, can, this is like a, an explanation, a scientific explanation for the expression being in sync with someone. His research shows that when you are communicating most effectively, you can get a group of people's brains to synchronize their activity. So as you relate someone's desires through a story, they become the de desires of the audience. And this is why when we watch a movie and trouble develops, the audience all gasps in unison, right? We're all in sync in that moment. So for as long as you've got your audience's attention, they are in your mind. And this suggests that people with a platform are disproportionately powerful. Bullet number four, emotional simulation is a foundation for empathy and allows us to create Oh, sorry for empathy and empathy allows us to create connections and relationships. This is from the research of Paul Zak, and he identified oxytocin as the neurochemical response. I'm sorry, the neurochemical responsible for empathy. So oxytocin, you may have heard of, it's called the love hormone. And when the brain synthesizes oxytocin, people are more trustworthy, generous, charitable, and compassionate. His research found that stories have the ability to increase our levels of oxytocin in the blood. And that's why character-driven stories with emotional content transport us. And they result in better understanding of the key points of a speak that a speaker wishes to make. And again, enable better recall. Lastly, the study specific to job seekers by Ben Gerder, Carvelin, and Cabin, and it found that recruiters gave higher recommendations for applicants who produced more stories and pseudo stories. Pseudo stories were just more general and more abstract than a real story. <clears throat> um, and this suggests that recruiters are sensitive to the presence of narrative content in applicants' responses to past behavior questions. Moreover, they found that when an applicant said things, they made a, a self-description, like I'm a good communicator, that decreased the hiring recommendations. So the fact that narrative content increases recommendations and non-narrative content decreases hiring recommendations suggests that not only are interviewees expected to remember incidents, but they're also expected to frame them as interesting and relevant narratives. Well, hopefully I've convinced you about why you should tell stories on a job interview. What I'd like to do now is to turn your attention to the handout, which is an example of a story told on a job interview. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read the, hand, the story in the handout specifically. And then I'm going to ask you um, to look at the story and see if it meets the six criteria that we're going to go over together. So take a couple of minutes and read that story. Okay, so let's look at it together. The first criteria for an effective story, now again, this is what um, the interviewer is listening for when you tell a story, is, is the story internally consistent? 
So when we're listening to a story, we're listening for how well it hangs together. If it's confusing or disjointed, um, we think it's a story not well told. Or if the applicant were to say in a story, you know, I'm very reliable, and then she shows up late to the interview, we would think, well, is this story really true? It like sort of lacks integrity. So if you would in the chat box now, answer the following. Do you think that this story is internally consistent? See, we have a couple of people playing along and so far three yeses, four yeses out of four. Stays on point and doesn't waver all over the place. We're on two different topics. Yes, that's a good point. Great. Seems, oh, we have one no. That's interesting. But largely we have yes. Someone commented that it's honest and authentic and undecided. Okay. Well, let's see uh, how it meets the next criteria. Is the story consistent with facts or stories the listener holds to be true? So this question is asking us, does the story ring true for us because it's consistent what, with what we already believe? So in this case, this is um, a person who became a supervisor of her peers. I think most of us would agree that's a pretty tough spot to be in. Um, so if you believe that someone might have trouble managing a team that she was once a peer of, then this, would, this kind of story would be consistent with your set, set of already existing beliefs. Um, so do you believe that the story was consistent with facts or stories that you hold to be true? Oh, Elizabeth, thanks for writing number two. Yes, Jessica, she didn't do the right thing the first year. She did admit her mistake and is changing. So we're hoping there's some, um, you know, hope for remediation there. She showed growth, okay. Okay, seems like people think she, it's consistent with what they think, what they believe to be true. Number three, is the story relevant to the question asked? So here she was told, asked, it was a prompt, um, not a question, describe a time when you displayed leadership. And so did she, did she answer the question being asked is really what we're evaluating here. I see some yeses. It, yes, it was very lengthy. Yes, and um, and I can appreciate that you said that. We can talk more about that. Okay, great. And she gave her definition of leadership in the beginning. You know, her definition of leadership was doing something when, even when it was hard and right, um, despite the fact that it was really hard. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I'm saying okay. Um, Lisa sees some red flags. Okay. All right, and somebody commented, it's a little winded and wordy. You know, I think, I think um, telling a story, and we could go back to this, is sort of an iterative process. And um, we'll talk later about the importance of telling, it to, the telling a story to friends and other people first so that you get feedback, so that you can edit it if it's unclear or too long. Number four, does the story show, show emphasis, details of plot, character, and action, or tell the listener what the point is. So here, a, fun, a fundamental principle of storytelling is show, don't tell. So stories reveal who we are as opposed to narrate who we are. And showing means providing details of a plot, characterization, and action. And these actually help the listener to believe and trust the candidate. Um, an example of telling might be, you know, I'm an effective leader. I'm exaggerating, but you'll get the idea. I'm an effective leader because I was promoted to supervise my peer group. It was challenging at first because they were understandably resistant, but I took the steps necessary and over time they came around. It's sort of telling me or telling the listener what to think. So does the story show or tell? Okay, we got some tells in there. 
Someone said there was a lot of detail which, which helped them visualize. Okay, and someone's pointing out to the actions that she took that were specific. Okay. We've got mostly shells, shows, and I combine shows and tells. <laughs> we got mostly shows and a couple of tells. Uh, someone's saying story shows, which was why it was long and windy. We're going to talk about that. Um, just want to move through the rest of them. So number five, does the story lead to a single conclusion? So here we're looking at if the story leads the interviewer to draw a single conclusion rather than be ambiguous or open to many interpretations. Um, and so obviously the teller is telling us this story, hoping that we'll see her as an effective leader, someone who's willing to do what's hard because it's the right thing to do. So does the story uh, support this single conclusion? I got one yes for number five. Another yes, concrete example of handling a difficult situation. Gives people the impression of growing but not really becoming a leader. It moves systematically to a single conclusion. Mm, she doesn't give examples of how they improved. Yep, I agree. It shows that she was able to be a leader even if the fruits of her labor were not clear at the end. Okay, so there are some things, so some room for improvement in the story. Lastly, how does the way the story is told reflect the teller's values, beliefs, sense of self or sense of others, or her outlook? And here we're looking at how the applicant tells the story. And since we're at a disadvantage, we can't see how she's telling it, um, whether she's passionate or detached, we can't see her facial expressions or body language. It's, it's harder for us to determine her emotions about the story. So we'll look instead at how she positions herself. What does the way this story is told say about the applicant? She comes across as informed. She comes across as honest about her shortcomings. And on the flip side of that is she showed she only got serious when she was promoted. And the flip side of that is that she can make mistakes and be transparent. She shows self-awareness, determination to grow. Okay. She's self-reflective. Uh, she described her leadership with I instead of we. Hmm. I would ask, I told them, I sat with them. So, so it definitely prompts some follow-up questions too, so that you could gather more information. I, th I think these are all uh, valid. Um, the idea here was to look at these criteria as a tool that can help you assess your own stories. And I want to give you sort of, um, formula is not the right word, but sort of a structure for telling your own stories. I always start, when I'm constructing a story, I always start with the end in mind. What's my goal? Um, a goal to entertain, uh, you know, is going to elicit a different story than a goal to inform or a goal a goal to influence or persuade. So know the purpose of your story, focus on the reason why you were telling a story, and that will help you make the point you want to make. Um, I, also, I often will back into a story. I'll start with the end in mind and sort of reverse engineer. So I'll think about what do, you, what do I want to convey? Values, abilities, competencies, traits, for example, such as ambition, education, networking. Um, and then what is the situation that I was in and the action that I took that demonstrates those qualities or competencies or that result? And those are the three components. So the situation or the context, uh, which includes maybe a challenge, often it includes a challenge or prom problem you faced. The actions that you took um, and the strategies that you employed and then the outcome or the results. So here I'll give you an example of a story and I'll break it down to each of those buckets. I was going with my boss to meet a potential client in the Midwest. Midwest. She was making a presentation, pitching them a software product the firm had been working on for a year. I was a junior member of the team and had been on a couple of sales calls. We took separate flights and planned to meet at the hotel the morning of the meeting. And that would give us time to review the PowerPoint and catch up on any outstanding issues. And that morning she texted me that her flight was delayed. 
what? I panicked. She said I could do this, but I wasn't so sure. So this is an example of the situation or the context. Imagine that you were watching a movie. This is the opening shot and what the viewer would see. And you can see that it's also sort of building the tension um, that's leading to the challenge that the interviewee will face or is facing. <laughs> then the action. When I got to the hotel, I reminded myself that I had seen the presentation before and I knew the material. I sat down with a cup of coffee and reviewed the slides. My boss called me to answer any questions and give me some last minute tips. I went to the ladies room and rehearsed in front of a mirror. It helped a lot to hear myself say the words out loud. So this is describing the strategy she'd employed and the actions that she took. The teller is faced with a choice and oftentimes good stories, good meaning emotionally, uh, emotionally driven or the kinds that our brains like, which have drama and tension, often have a challenge or a, pro a problem. So the teller is faced with a choice. She can ask to postpone the meeting. She can ask that her boss join her virtually in the meeting. And here, and she's telling us that what she chose to do and how she went about preparing for it. And then the result, when I got to the meeting, I was nervous, but I did it. I delivered the presentation. I'd say it went fine. Not great, not bad. I know I'll get better the more I do it. Afterwards, the clients wanted to speak to my boss naturally, to ask her a few questions that I couldn't answer. So I made sure to schedule that meeting between them. I followed up with my boss to see if she received any feedback from them and if there was anything I could have done differently. And I told her I'd like to do it again. So here the teller is actually telling us the outcome or the results of the action she took. And if the results were unsatisfactory, then you wanna emphasize the lessons learned and what you would do differently next time. So not all stories will have a conflict, um, but you can still apply this formula. And then you can evaluate the story that you construct against the six criteria that we just discussed. So we were talking earlier about the importance of preparation. It's also really important to practice telling your stories. Um, you need to hear your story out loud to hear how it sounds. Uh, and also storytelling is interactive. It's a two-way dialogue, it's two-way interaction between the teller and the listener. So the responses of the listener actually influence the way the teller is telling the story. So, so the listener is an active sounding board for us. And once you identify a listener, I'm calling them a dedicated listener, it could be a friend, could be a coach, it could be, um, you know, a colleague, could be a therapist. So once you identify a dedicated listener, ask them to listen to your story and provide input on the following. Like, are you being authentic? Do you come across as genuine? Do you own your story? Are you speaking extemporaneously? You don't want to be over-rehearsed. You want to be prepared, but not over-rehearsed. Are you making an emotional connection? Remember, it's that emotional connection that transports the listener to feel empathy, to want to bond with you and create a connection. Is your story concise? And that was a point that came up in the example of the handout. Um, stories need to be effective. So they want to communicate, stories communicate a lot of data in, in often a short amount of time, but we want to be respectful of the amount of time that you have in an interview. So a story can be concise. Are your body, facial expressions, tone, and voice in alignment with your story? So you could also practice telling these stories at networking events and conferences. Wherever you're meeting people and the stakes are low, these are good opportunities to practice, engage people's reactions, hear what questions they have, iterate, you know, revisit your story, change it, tell it anew to somebody else. So I mentioned that preparation is key. Um, and I suggest preparing what I'm calling like back pocket stories, stories that you could have in your back pocket for any job interview. And so those are, these are just some suggestions, by no means exhaustive. These are just some that came up at the top of my head. As I mentioned earlier, some of the most common questions is not really a question at all. Tell me about yourself. So the interviewer is wanting to get to know the professional side of you, not, not the personal side of you. And this question can appear to break the ice or even feel like small talk but it's not a throwaway question. 
It can be a quick way for a busy manager to learn a lot about you in a short time. And how you respond to an unstructured prompt allows them to evaluate what you say. So they're looking for what are your priorities, if you understand what's important to this job. They're evaluating how you say it. Are you a good communicator? Are you confident? And I believe that preparation and forethought are really essential to answering in a way that is clear, concise again, and, and relevant to the question. Otherwise, you may be tempted to tell your whole life story. And, and, and your story shouldn't go any longer than two minutes. So a key to answering tell me about yourself is to know where to start your story. If you're a recent graduate, you can start with why you chose a particular career path. If you're a mid-career professional, think about what you've done that is relevant to the job you are applying for. So if you're applying for a managerial position, for example, you want to focus on your managerial experience. And perhaps you start with your first managerial job and how you were excited about it. Perhaps you don't go that far back. Again, it's going to depend on where you are in your career trajectory. One thing to definitely not do is definitely don't regurgitate your resume. They have that in front of them. And focus your response on what you believe is important to the interviewer, not to you. So I have an example uh, from the interviewguys.com where somebody answers the, the prompt, tell me about yourself. I'd really describe myself as a person with a versatile skill set, a lot of integrity, and a willingness to go the extra mile to satisfy a customer. Perhaps the best way to let you know what I'm about is to share with you a quick experience I had. So the first sentence is the applicant telling us who he is, not showing us, right? He's announced, it's kind of like when you, if you were, if I stepped into this webinar and I announced, I'm a good person, I'm smart, I'm talented, I'm successful. Um, that's likely to increase your suspicion of me rather than build your trust of me, right? People want to decide their, these things for themselves. That's one of the powers of story. It reveals who we are so people can decide who we are. So what I like about what he does is he answers the prompt directly, which demonstrates that he's focused and on target. And then he says, I'd, and I'd like to tell you a story to show you. Recently, while working at a location with a client, they mentioned that they had just purchased some software that I was familiar with, but that their computer systems were having some difficulty integrating. I offered to take a look at the install, found there was a step that somehow had, gotten, had been forgotten. And I told them I would be happy to wipe the system and reinstall the software correctly. At first he refused. And when I asked him why, he said it was too expensive. And they were just gonna figure out a workaround. When I asked him further, he told me a different analyst had been in, looked at the problem and told them their files had corrupted their system overall and it would take $25,000 to fix it. When I told him it was a simple matter of wiping the previous version and reinstalling it, he was stunned. And I did the whole project for a fraction of the cost that the other analyst had quoted. My client was so happy, he referred me to his friends. And I've done similar work for several other companies in town as a result. So you can see how the story shows how he walks the walk and helps build trust in him. Um, and it, the story demonstrates how the candidate is who he said he is. And you'll notice too that the story follows that situation action result model that I showed you a couple of moments ago. What's a little different and why it's a tell me about yourself story is that he, link, he continues and he links his past and his present to his future by saying, now I'm looking to take my career to the next level and move out of contract work into a full-time employee for a company where I can be part of a team, but that also allows me to focus my energy and my best strength working directly with customers. I'd like to build a long-term career that lets me focus on professional growth. I think it would be even stronger if, he's, if he linked that part to the companies that he's interviewing with. But I think tell me about your, yourself stories require a lot of forethought. There are a couple of interesting TED Talks that I sometimes recommend to my students. I think Mark Bezos, like Jeff Bezos, B-E-Z-O-S, has a five minute TED Talk about being a volunteer fire, firefighter. And I think it shows a lot about who he is and what's important to him. 
And I think in that way, it's kind of a who I am story that shows his values, which I think can be very helpful in building trust with an interviewer. And then a why I'm here story, like why you're interested in this company or this job. Um, I think those kinds of stories help people, you know, to show why you're invested and why you're committed to this uh, organization or this position. I recommend watching David Kelly's TED talk about creative confidence, where towards the end he talks about how his bout with ca cancer really informed the work that he wants to do for the rest of his life. I have one last slide and that will take us to our question and answer period. And this, this slide is really about the story that we tell ourselves. I mean, we tell ourselves stories all the time. And I think that can have a real impact on, you know, how we see ourselves. So, and I think this can be especially important for people who are undergoing a career transition, which can be a time of confusion, loss, insecurity, and uncertainty. Creating a, and telling a story that resonates with us helps us to believe in ourselves. If you've watched Chimamanda Adichie's TED Talk, um, she talks about the power of a single story, actually the danger of a single story. And when we hear the same story over and over, or when we tell ourselves the same story in the same way, it becomes our reality. Even if that story is just one side of a story, it's incomplete. So it's important for us to be mindful of the story we tell ourselves, especially during times of transition, when it can feel like we're torn between holding on to our past story and embracing a future story. And these are times when our narrative no longer feels coherent. <clears throat> Excuse me. This comes from the work of Herminia Abera and Kent Lineback. And they say all of us want a story that makes sense. And they want the people who hire us to feel like the events in our lives make sense. Um, the challenge is making your listener and yourself believe that a change makes sense for you, that the change you're embarking on makes sense for you. And so they advise that when you're explaining a change in your career, focus on internal reasons. So look for things that you've learned about yourself that deepen your understanding of what you want moving forward. You know, I found that I'm good at X, Y, Z, and I want to pursue that. And that shows that you're learning and that you're on a journey of self-discovery, which is more powerful, they say, than focusing on external reasons which tend to create the impression that we simply accept our fate. Also, they recommend citing multiple reasons in your story, both personal and professional, that are compelling the change. And lastly, if there are any um, explanations that go back in time, ever since I was young, I had a passion for XYZ, um, that can help uh, really uh, explain a change. And just know that we're continually rethinking, changing, retelling our life stories, and that's okay. And oftentimes we'll have different stories for different selves, and that's part of the process too. We and our stories are a work in progress. So I think I'll just leave it at that for now and see if you folks have any questions that you may have chatted or asked. Fantastic, thank you so much. If, um, so we do have a few minutes for some Q&A, so if you have any questions for Nancy, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A pane below. So we have a couple of questions already, Nancy. Earlier you were kind of talking about some of those stories that you can go ahead and have in your back pocket, like, who mm -hmm. am I? Why am I here? We have one person who asked, is it worthwhile to describe how you got where you are or to a certain point, or is that just going to be too tedious and just kind of elongate that story to, to make it past that two minute mark. Without knowing the person or where they are on their career trajectory, my guess is that we'll elongate the story. I think people are most concerned with uh, what do you have in your experience that is going to make you effective in this position. And if you spend too much time on your backstory, I think you might detract from that message. So, uh, I'm a, maybe perhaps if you're uh, very young in your career and you mm -hmm. don't have much work experience to focus on. Um, but I think people want to know how you're going to help them to move forward. 
course. Thank you. So then the sure. next question is, how would you suggest handling a situation when an interviewer keeps interrupting your story with his or her own stories? Um, you beeped out a second, but I think I got it. When an interviewer interrupts with his or her own stories? Exactly. Um, well, I mean, I think that could be helpful, actually, because when we're listening to their stories, like listening is such an important part of storytelling, um, it, we're getting information about what's important to them, what their values are, perhaps specifics about the jobs. Sometimes we'll even hear about their career story. Um, and so I think that could be good fodder for, uh, you know, how we, the stories that we choose to tell and how we tell our stories. And also I think it might serve to help them make a connection with us. Um, which again, we've talked about the importance of emotional transportation. So um, I'm only hesitating because I know I've been on interviews where the, int the interviewer does all of the talking <laughs> and you don't really get a chance to tell your story. And there, I think you have to be, you know, you have to make a point of inserting yourself in because there are things that you want them to know about yourself. So um, perhaps find a gingerly way, <clears throat> not Definitely. aggressive way, yeah. It sounds like, I mean, earlier you were talking about having a dedicated listener and, you know, practice always makes perfect. So maybe when you're practicing kind of your stories to have in your back pocket, maybe you can ask that dedicated listener to be like, okay, this time when I do it, interrupt me a couple of times and like oh. interject your stories. And then that way you can practice on like, okay, so if they are going to interject at this time, how can I redirect it so I can finish up and get those like points to hit? So I love that. Um, so the next question we have is, you know, unfortunately, the world that we live in right now can still be very masculine, especially mm -hmm. in certain industries and jobs. Mm -hmm. Could telling a story ever be perceived to be too feminine and or unprofessional? Oh, wow. I love that question. That's a hard one, actually. My, my instinct is to say no, but maybe that's because I want it to be no. I think there are certain types of listeners that are not as open to storytelling. And in my experience, I can remember interviewing with somebody who I knew to be very scientific and was into data analytics. And I think um, people who have that kind of background are accustomed to hearing information in a certain way. Um, perhaps more linear or perhaps just more to the point. Of course, I'm, I'm generalizing, perhaps overgeneralizing. But I do remember that feeling like that type of listener wasn't as receptive to a story. And so I quickly learned in the interview to dial it back a little. Um, I mean, she was also a she, so I don't think it was a gender issue. I have to think more on that question. Thank you to whoever asked that. No, of course, it's, it's such an important question to think about. And it, it's, it's a hard one to answer, especially with everything that's going on in the world. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. such a great question. So thank you so much um, for that. So the next question we have is, and you kind of touched a little bit about this during the presentation. So at TC, we definitely see a lot of our alumni who do that mid-career transitioning or they're re-entering the workforce after X amount of years. So we have one person who's been working for over 20 years and they're just kind of wondering, mm -hmm. how do they tell their story when they're re-entering at a managing executive position? Because you don't want to drone on and on and you want to kind of cut off your story around that two minute mark. So how do they figure out what are the key points to pull from their over 20 year of ex experience to make sure that their story is well-rounded and is able to show the interviewer their wealth of experience? Yeah, um, great question, thanks. I think it goes back to looking at the, the job, the role that you're applying for. What are the priorities of the job and the role? <clears throat> Excuse me, sort of revert, like I mentioned earlier, reverse engineering. What are the stories that highlight or address those priorities? or the actions that you took that show the competencies that are required for that job responsibility. So I guess the good news is if 20 years experience is you, pro experience, you probably have a lot of experiences to draw from. 
Um, that's the flip side to having too many experiences. I would say start with the job description and look, look, keep the interviewer's needs in mind and then fashion your response to meet his or her needs. Fantastic. So I think on the next slide, Nancy, you have your contact information. Oh, I do. Thanks. Sadly, we're kind of at time, so I know we weren't able to answer all of everyone's questions. So I'm so sorry that we didn't have time, but Nancy has generously just uh, provided her contact information. So if we did not answer your question today, please feel free to shoot her an email or connect with her on LinkedIn to get those questions answered. Nancy, I just want to take the time to thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today, learning how to tell stories in our interviews and making sure how we can best hone them in with our dedicated listeners so we have these stories in our back pocket. Everyone, Thank I just you. want to let you know that TC will be planning more digital events in the near future, so please stay tuned to emails from TC, Alumni Relations, and our social media channels. You will be receiving a link to this video presentation in a follow-up email. We hope you can join us for this year's academic festival, which is from October 20th to 24th. You can find more information about academic festival as well as registering by visiting www.tc.edu festival. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye everyone.